Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of All Nighter Discussions. And we have a special treat today because you don't have just one game. You have two. Yes. I'm being joined by my good friend, <laughs> fellow screenwriter, Gabe Braxton. Gabe, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate you having me on. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So we were talking about doing a podcast together and we were throwing uh, movies out there that we could talk about. I suggested the movie we're going to be discussing, Halloween uh -huh. 3, Season of the Witch. And um, I don't remember you instantly jumping to that and being like, oh, yeah, I, I definitely want to talk about that. So um, what led you here? Um, I mean, to, to want to talk about <laughs> Halloween 3? Yeah. Well, um, it OK, so it's kind of like one of those movies where you know, like you either love it or you hate it. And when I first watched it though, like I remember like I liked it, but it wasn't something that really stuck with me. But then when you brought it up to like talk about it again, it was like, first of all, I had to like kind of remember, okay, oh yeah, it's that one. And then, uh, and then I started to really think about it. I'm like, actually, you know what? That would be something that'd be really fun to talk about. So here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's an extremely polarizing movie. It's considered the black sheep in a franchise that just is full of black sheep movies. Like every couple of Halloween movies, people are saying, this is the worst one. This is the worst one. Yeah. You know, we're um, coming off of Halloween Kills. We're recording this yeah. um, about a week or so after its release. And again, people were saying that's the worst one. I'm like, you guys got to stop saying this. Yeah. I mean, that's what happens when when you have something so major like this, you know, like a major franchise. People just sometimes just get on a bandwagon of hate. Yeah. And it really is good marketing for the franchise. <laughs> I guess so, because they keep making money. <laughs> they yeah. keep making money. What's interesting, because people take the first Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween, so seriously that yeah. even though it's a slasher movie and – you know, that's not like the most ambitious kind of film to make necessarily. Uh, people still hold these movies up to a very high standard and they're uber critical when they feel like their, you know, standards haven't been met, right? Which mm -hmm. is why some of these uh, movies, which are, you know, I mean, I haven't seen any that I just hated. Right. Uh, they met with such vitriol. Mm -hmm. This one included, this is the first Halloween movie where people walked out of the theater saying, I hate it. I hate that movie. You know, screw that movie. That That is such an insult to, to the original movie. Um, and I think the reason is obvious, right? What yeah. would you say the reason is? Well, I mean, it's like, I mean, okay. So when I first watched it, I was like, well, okay, that was different, right? I mean, it's not necessarily about Michael Myers, then not at all <laughs> really any way shape or form um but uh i i would say that you know people maybe got a little bit nervous to say where where's my where's my franchise going right like to me though like what i kind of wanted to get your opinion on was like you know what if this created uh more of a anthology type of halloween you Which, know what I mean? Exactly. That was exactly the plan with this movie. John okay, Carpenter. Okay. Yeah. John Carpenter was done with Michael Myers. He didn't uh -huh. even want to do Halloween too. Um, but he did that one. Then he's like, no, we're done. Let's, if we're going to keep doing Halloween movies, let's mm -hmm. make this an anthology series. Let's tell different horror stories right. set around Halloween. Um, and this was going to be the first stab at that. Obviously the way the public freaked out, um, they, they abandoned that pretty instantly. And I have a question for you that we'll get to later on about that. But, okay. you know, sticking with this movie and its legacy, you know, for a long time, it was considered one of the worst sequels. Um, but by the time I saw it, it started gaining something of a cult following. People started to appreciate it more. And I think now it's considered maybe one of the best sequels right mm. as far as the fans are concerned so you know you recently rewatched re the movie uh what what are your thoughts now ah uh, i mean i just i like it i, I love movies that kind of like take me into like a different world like and, and kind of immerse me into something maybe that i'm not used to um and 
really just swing for a home run. Mm. And I feel like season of the witch like swings for a home run. I mean, it definitely, I mean, right off the bat, right. You're just introduced with this like 1980s, like digital, like electronic music and intro. And you're like, what what the hell am I getting myself into? And it just, it continues down that road of, of this theme of like, this digital um, world uh, throughout the whole film. And that's something that's way different than Halloween one and two and something that it was fun to, to experience. Yeah. I mean, for me, as somebody who doesn't like cherish this franchise, like I obviously I, I like the first movie and if you can make Morgan movies of it, great, but I don't feel offended um, or hold it to sacrilege when you know you you maybe go in a different direction or try new things so with this movie i was totally on board for the idea of going off in a completely different direction and the execution really sold me because i love this movie's atmosphere Mm -hmm. i love the it's just kind of a crazy premise um really out there premise and it's hardcore i mean it's about killing kids right yeah so in a lot of ways, this is more of an ideal, like an ideal horror movie than most of the, the movies in this franchise because it's tense and there are huge stakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Like, I, I would say that, you know, I'm not really like the biggest Halloween franchise like fan, even though I, I must show you, I'm actually wearing a hat and Phil High uh, shirt. All that is cool. I was like trying to get into the... I don't know the rhythm of what we're doing here. So as you can see, Haddonfield High School. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not like super, super like into it. I've kind of, I mean, here I am, right? Like I, I, uh, I was born in 1987, right? So obviously I wasn't at the theater and I, I wasn't going to see these movies as they were coming out. So like, I, I kind of like am able to look at it from a whole different perspective as I look back and see the kind of mess that the Halloween timeline is. And I'm kind of like, well, now I can just kind of go into any movie of the Halloween series and know that maybe there's going to be some things that some hardcore fans were, you know, upset with and be able to just kind of accept those for what they are and enjoy them a little differently than maybe if I, you know, saw those films in theaters at the time and, and, uh, you know, was kind of like raised with it. Yeah, I think it's a movie that benefits from hindsight a lot. I definitely right. get backlash right. at the time, especially because I don't think the marketing made it clear that Michael Myers was not in this movie. So if that's the case, yeah, I definitely get people being pissed off. I probably mm-hmm. really, I would have been because, you know, there had only been two Halloween movies. Why abandon such a popular character so early on? But John Carpenter, he had only ever wanted to do one movie and he tried to keep to his integrity. He didn't want to keep milking this cow. And, you know, he left the franchise after this. He mm-hmm. hasn't been involved until the 2018. So kills are oh, okay. Yeah. The 2018 one is mm-hmm. the first one where he really came back. So let's explain the premise a little bit for people who probably haven't seen the movie. Um, it's about, and we're going to, try to refrain from spoilers, I suppose, but we'll definitely be talking about the ending later on. So warning for that, but you have somebody who is trying to use Halloween masks to perform um, a ceremonial sacrifice on a Halloween night. And it's up to one alcoholic womanizing doctor (laughs) and and his uh, beautiful, much younger than him kind of sidekick heroine to, to stop them. Right. Um, now there is a Michael Myers element because the main villain has these henchmen who I think yeah. are if you put the Michael Myers mask on them, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Right, right. I thought I was thinking about that today. Like how interesting that is, is like all those henchmen, they have the same mannerisms mm-hmm. as Michael Myers, you know, that slow walk and just kind of like brute force grab you and manhandle you type of thing. Yeah, and the way they just kind of appear out of nowhere. Yeah. In fact... Can't ever get away from them. Yeah, the lead henchman is played by Dick Warlock, who played Michael Myers in Halloween 2. 
Yeah, I um, I heard that. Yeah, yeah. So John Carpenter definitely loved the idea of this kind of this villain who seemed not to be a human, like something more supernatural, but mm -hmm. bound in a human body. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like going back to Assault on Precinct Thirteen, his first big movie, like it's kind of zombies without zombies in a way. I'm doing a terrible job of explaining it, but he likes these kind of these human shapes that carry this inhuman evil. And right. And there's some un uncanniness to it, right? I mean, exactly. The, the way they they interact, you know, it's not unnatural. It makes you kind of feel uneasy. Now, one criticism this movie still gets is that the main character, the doctor, is a terrible protagonist. Um, I have the opposite hmm. reaction. I love this guy. <laughs> um, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the everyman protagonist. I really love that. I love flawed characters. He's a very flawed character. <laughs> He's very flawed character. <laughs> but played really well by Tom Atkins, who yeah. you know, was a big character actor of before movies in the 80s. You know, he's worked with John Carpenter before. And I think he just brings a lot of um, charm to a guy who could have just come across as a big sleaze bag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think like, okay, my my first watching. You know, I kind of like didn't see how much of a sleaze bag like he is in the film. And then I watched it again. And I'm like, this guy's such a dirtbag. Yeah. But it's it's so interesting because you're right, because he's kind of lovable at the same time. And you just you're kind of you're rooting for him, even though, yeah, he is this like this womanizer. Um, he's an alcoholic. Yeah. He's you know, got a terrible relationship with his ex-wife. And he's got a terrible relationship with his kids. And uh, I mean, the thing is, he's very down on his luck. Yeah, very. Right. And very. that puts us on his side. Um, but the, then he's got this like Dr. Swagger. Right. So, and he uses it. He uses it to his advantage yeah. um, in the film. Now, some people say the only reason he's like on this mission to uncover the mystery of the masks. Uh, <laughs> people say that he's only trying to get into this woman's pants, the the daughter of this man who mysteriously died in his hospital. I didn't read it that way. I actually thought he genuinely wanted to uncover this mystery. I mean, a guy died in his hospital and another guy lit himself on fire. So I'd want to know what's up too. But yeah, he definitely takes advantage of the situation. Um, yeah. Leading to one of the worst sex scenes in um, all of <laughs> history. I'm I'm of the I'm actually of of the the camp of both. Like I think, I think the one thing for me that says this this guy actually has a motive that's deeper than sex is uh, the fact that he's a doctor, right? Mm. But in the hospital, you know, when he is looking at Ellie, um, it's kind of like this: I'm sad, you're sad, let's be sad together type of attitude. <laughs> that he, yeah, I mean, I that he they gives actually, like they have something that bonds them they do yeah. have this kind yeah, of, they do. of you know loss and, mm -hmm. and being broken in some way um not that like i want to see them make out but there <laughs> at least was an attempt in the screenplay and with the actors to make that relationship possible mm -hmm. but we're not watching halloween movies for the romance we're watching them for <laughs> kills the suspense um, right. And the kills in this movie are grotesque. People don't yeah. talk about this movie enough in terms of how brutal it is. It, it, it's, it's extremely brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what's one of the first kills we see? Like, a man dig his fingers it's, in somebody's eye sockets? Yeah. I mean, like, we don't have Michael Myers in there with the knife, right? Stabbing people. But we do have this guy stabbing his finger into an eye socket. And then he, you know, takes what his, his thumb. So he takes his index finger and his thumb. And then after he's just successfully dug a grave in this guy's face, he grabs like his, the bone in between his eyes and then just yanks it forward and it's makes gross. like a, yeah. a ski jump off this guy's face. Uh, and yeah, it's very, and, and it's, and it's not like the, the blood is like there, but it's a liquidy blood. So it's, it's really gross. It feels more like pus, like a red pus coming out of this guy's face instead of like dark red blood. Yeah. I mean, it's a hard, the kills in this are hard to watch. 
I would right. go as far as to say that um, they add a lot of menace to the villains. So I'm still for it. But it's interesting to note that when we talk, like people are saying Halloween Kills is one of the goriest, one of the bloodiest. Um, and, you know, you have the Rob Zombie movies. Those are really gory, too. But people don't include this movie in the conversation. And I, I mean, this movie came out at a time when, I mean, horror movies weren't just expected to go out all out like that. It was it was a risk. Um, and I think critics didn't like that either. I think they called the movie out for how um, gory it was. But, you know, sticking through this mystery, right? We have our main characters going to this town to investigate a, a mask making factory. Um, I'm surprised this movie hasn't been canceled for how anti-Irish it is. <laughs> I, you know, that was like one of the questions I had. It's like, maybe I completely missed something, but I'm just wondering why so many Irish undertones. I, I looked up like Stonehenge, right? Like, that's like a big deal mm -hmm. in the in the film. And I'm like, I don't think Stonehenge was in Ireland. It's not, it's in Southern England. And I'm like, maybe you could, maybe you caught something that I didn't. Um, other than I guess that in the end they kind of like talk about it a little more, but I was just curious as like, damn, like why they go so Irish with it? I think, and please don't quote me on this. I mean, I'm posting this publicly, so I guess do quote me on this. But I think in Irish <laughs> history, there is you know, there's something about the Celtic history mm -hmm. that they were trying to tap into. Okay, um, and you know, the Celtic theme is one that runs throughout this franchise in some form or another, but here they make it overt to a comical degree. Um, that That's a part of the movie that didn't age well. Um, but at the same time, you get a really great villain played by a famous Irish character actor who is also the villain in the RoboCop movies. Mm -hmm. Don't know if you've seen those. Mm -hmm. I have, I just uh, didn't recognize. I mean, yeah. I have seen those a long time ago. Yeah, if you go back, he's like the CEO of Omnicorp. Okay. Yeah. And here, he really gets to crank it up to 11 in terms of how, in terms of how much he gets to do, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when we first see him, he's like a Willy Wonka type. He's like a sweet old man. Very, he's very, like, yeah. Seems to love kids. And then when he turns villainous, when you see that, his demeanor doesn't change. He's still very much the same sweet old man. It's just... But to hear that guy saying these lines mm -hmm. and, and to see the malevolence in his eyes, I thought it was really a great villain. Um, super underrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point you, you make about, about his uh, demeanor not changing because it is there is something that's just unsettling about, you know, somebody being able to keep the same face and say something completely on the other end of a spectrum. You know what I mean? And that's exactly what he does. You know, he gives that um speech in the same type of tone as he would talking to a kid you know what i mean and it's just kind of like yeah. oh, you're a little little messed up there yeah and the last time you see him in the movie he gives this look that i'm always going to remember he like he does this smirk and he does the slow clap um and i guess comparing him to michael myers you know i mean it am i scared of seeing that guy you know, um, stalking me? Do, do I fear seeing him in my closet? Not exactly. It's a different type of menace. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they didn't try to just recreate the Michael Myers effect, just um, it's another risk they took. I guess it didn't, it didn't pay off at the time, but yeah, people certainly appreciate it now. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, um, you'd probably be scared, like, you know, seeing him with your kids, something like that, you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> You know, because like I'm a, I'm a parent, we got two little girls and uh, when you're kind of like, yeah, as a parent, you're always like kind of cautious about who's around your kids and what your kids are doing, watching and, um, and who they're following. And so I could imagine like the, the parental um, fan base or not so much fan base, but viewership of this film being a little like un unsettled, especially in the 80s where you know the the like witchcraft is that you you know that's a definite belief in society and, and um as far as like n looking at that stuff negatively um so yeah yeah 
Now, I want to call out some of the criticisms that are made of this movie because people like to make fun of the plot and the story and the plot mm. holes and how ridiculous it is. Okay, let's look at the first Halloween movie plot-wise. Mm. Okay, this, this kid who's been institutionalized since he was six years old um, steals a car and drives it all the way to the next town to follow around a bunch of random girls um, and his doctor follows him there and just by strolling through the neighborhoods of Haddonfield, he finally finds Michael Myers and, you know, shoots him six times, but that doesn't, that doesn't kill Michael Myers. He still gets back up because he's so evil. He, he can't be killed. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, on the face of it, is that, does that make perfect rational sense? No, Absolutely but, not. <laughs> no, but who cares? It's a movie. Yeah. It's yeah. its own world. So I just don't find those criticisms fair. Now, I would love to get into a little bit of backstory here. The director of this movie, Halloween 3, is Tommy Lee Wallace. Do you Mm. recognize his name? No, only from this movie. Yeah, so he directed the It miniseries. Okay, I didn't know there was one. Oh, yeah, it's the famous one with Tim Curry as Pennywise. You said a miniseries? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... The way he got involved is he was he worked on the first Halloween, I think, as a production designer. But then he was supposed to direct Halloween, two, but he hated the script for that so much that he backed out. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Because the script was rushed and John Carpenter was like drunk when he wrote it or something. (laughs) I try that. It doesn't work out too well. No, John. (laughs) Um, But he came back for this one because he also was excited about doing something new. Uh, I think his direction is pretty good in this. I think, you know, it's very Carpenter-esque. He's doing a lot of those gliding shots. Um, His lighting is very kind of um, deliberate and stark. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so no call-outs there. If this movie had done well, I would have been interested to see his career trajectory, but I'm guessing since it bombed, he had limited options as to what he could do. Right. Yeah. But going on from that fun fact, um, let's talk about, let me pull up my notes here. Let, let, let me ask you this question. Yeah. Is this movie the best Halloween sequel in your opinion? Man, that's no, but it's up there for me. I like it, you know, for what, personally. What would, what would be your favorite sequel? Well, at this point, it's probably like Halloween Kills. Like I just watched that the other day, you know, like, and I just, I just really enjoyed it. So mm-hmm. um, that one's still very fresh, though, right? You probably have to give it some mm-hmm. time. Yeah, but it's got like, like, like I'm saying, like, I'm kind of looking at it all hindsight, right? Like I'm looking like kind of what you were just talking about, how you're not watching Halloween for like the romance. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're watching it for the kills. You're watching it for the suspense and stuff. And there was just a lot of things. It was chaotic. And there's just a lot of things I, I liked about it. But if, okay, let's say, let's throw that one out the window. And I'd probably say H2, H2O. I was watching it just last night. H2O? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I would probably say that. Um, oh, I don't know. I, I watched that one when I was young, man. And yeah. I just, I just, you know, vibe with like L Cool J's character in it. And you know what I mean? It's just, it's just like a cool one. It doesn't make any sense, but it's cool. <laughs> I have some problems with that movie. Not well, there, there are some problems yeah. with that movie. Dude. Yeah. I know that. The sequels that are considered the best are Halloween 2, Halloween H2O, and the 2018 one. Those are the ones I hear the most. Um, None of those are even like in my top five. So that's interesting. Um, (laughs) Because again, I think those movies are trying to just recreate the original movie to some extent, Mm -hmm. or at least capitalize on it. Um, I like the weird ones. I like the really weird ones. I like Halloween 6. Do you remember that one? Oh, uh, refresh. Or give me, the give me cult a little bit of refresh. One where, uh, oh, uh, gosh. Where... That one's, like, really weird. Yes. That one's really... mean... Isn't that the one with, like, the um, the young guy who's, like, weird? And he's, like, it, got his own little, like, research, research room or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one's weird. 
Oh, it's it's super weird. And again, I just I dig it. Um, I don't, I don't think it's a great movie, but I I dig the vibe. Yeah, yeah. And so in that spirit, yeah, I would say Halloween three is probably my favorite. Um, almost by default because I just don't think that there was enough to the character of Michael Myers to make a whole franchise out of. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're mad at me for saying that, John Carpenter agrees with me. You know, <laughs> exactly what he said when he was making Halloween too. Yeah, I'm sure uh, John Carpenter's uh, pockets would disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's so funny. Uh, somebody asked him how he felt about the sequels, and he said, "All I'll say is, every time they make a new Halloween movie, I, uh, I hold out my hand, and a little check flies into it." <laughs> Yeah, so he has the right attitude for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this leads into another question, right? What if this movie had come out not as Halloween 3? What if it was just Season of the Witch? That's right? tough. I was thinking about that today. Um, and I almost feel like it would have just flew under the radar and not been anything. I don't, I don't, I feel like, yeah, mm-hmm. Halloween, you, you know, you, you, Halloween a tag of Halloween on it, like heard it and it helped it, in my opinion. Just the, just my my feel for it. That's so interesting. So I, I I see where you're coming from on that. But the fact that it came out, it was hated because it was Halloween three. And then now it has a cult following, a really mm-hmm. strong, devoted one. I think if it had been released a season of the witch, the word of mouth would have uh, been strong enough to maybe not make it a big box office hit, but it would not have to fight, you know, a bad reputation for so long. I think it would have slowly built as a, as a cult movie. And, you know, you have John Carpenter's name on it. You have um, some, uh, I think you have some things that would have helped it out. Okay. I see what you're saying. Like when you, so you still have like the cast and yeah, like John Carpenter working with it and Okay. Hmm. It's tough because I mean, even Michael Myers is in it. You know, he's on a commercial within the movie, which, which is a little weird. I don't understand me. that too much. Yeah, I don't know. I don't get that at all. Yeah. Um, but I do like, did you notice he has uh the his mask cameos during the first TV commercial of it? And I think that's yeah. at the gas station or something. Yeah. Um so, which is, I like that. I thought that was kind of neat. That was a little little um, Easter egg. That was cool. Yeah, uh, I think they show Michael Myers on the TV because they want to show that this is not in the same universe as Halloween. Mm-hmm. Which I actually think it would have been cooler if it was. What if this was a cinematic universe? You know, right? Because if you're already making Michael Myers supernatural, I don't, I don't know. I guess it was a smart decision in the end, but I personally think they didn't even have to address it. I mean. If you like look at this film and you you kind of look at, I mean, this is kind of digging deep into it, right? So like you look at the mannerisms of the henchmen that are like walking around and stuff. I mean, this could have been a Michael Myers origin story. It could have been, right? Just kind of like, well, maybe he's some, some type of like robot or something, right? Yeah. Like, I'm glad they didn't do that. I'm glad they stayed away from that. But there are some just interesting things. And I agree that they should have, like, I would have been completely okay with just the Easter egg of the mask on the commercial and then completely leaving out the other commercial where they sh- they're they advertising a movie called Halloween. Like, yeah. that, sh- I, that know, was just too weird. I think the audience probably read that as, um, as an insult. Like, oh, you wanted Michael Myers? Here he is. Right. Now back to our, you know, evil mask movie. Yeah, and I guess that's a good point. Like, maybe they did it to say Michael Myers is not in this movie. You know what I mean? Like, they, they do it kind of early on in the film. That and actually, I could, yeah, I can see how you could think maybe he's going to pop up. In the whole movie, you're anticipating him popping up, and he just doesn't. Yeah, just imagine being there in the audience, not knowing anything. Yeah. Just having to go through the confusion of realizing that this isn't just not a Michael Myers movie. It's not even a slasher movie. It's a completely different type of thing. So audiences just didn't have the resources that we do now. There was no Twitter. There's no, like, if this movie right, came out right. nowadays, people would be taken to social media like 
guys, Michael Myers is not in this movie. Don't even see it. Yeah. And so, I'll concede. I'll concede my point. Like, I think you're right. With John Carpenter's name on it and all that, I think it would have definitely been way more successful. I, I'm going to agree with yeah. that without I, Halloween 3 in the title. I don't know why he didn't direct it. Because, again, Michael Myers isn't in it. So, and, and the direction is so much in his style. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would have been a big boost if he had directed it. Um, mm. But, you know, he was busy with other things. He was probably making the thing around this time. Mm. So I'm glad he didn't direct it. But still, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if he was even thinking about it or he just never wanted to direct the Halloween movie again. Right. Yeah. But let's see here. We, you touched on something that I wanted to follow up on. Um, well, for right now, let's talk about probably the most famous scene in the movie, the scene where the kid gets murdered. Mm-hmm. What, and this will sound tasteless, but what an awesome scene. <laughs> like, it's, it's, yeah, it's shocking. It's shocking. Mm-hmm. It's so well made. It's so tense. Um, you have the, the freaking jingle playing the whole time, which, you know, there's something very sinister about jingles. And, and the movie really taps into some kind of, you know, critique of consumer culture and even capitalism. And they tap into a really sinister energy behind all of those institutions. So I don't know. I mean, I you have kids, right? So, I mean, yeah. it hit you even harder i bet yeah i mean just it's so interesting having kids and watching movies um it definitely is a little different you, you have more of like a soft spot for it i remember like pr- like prior to kids it'd be like okay whatever a kid died but like ne- like having kids it's just it's a lot different and even like watching it last night it's like holy shit like this is kind of shocking um and that like you're saying that scene is like so well done i mean the parents come like they're in the room right and it, they're oblivious you know to what's actually like taking place and it's just kind of this chaotic scene that just unfolds and you're just definitely not expecting that to happen i mean honestly i I think what i was expecting was kind of like almost like a possession to where the kid goes crazy Mm -hmm. but what does happen i definitely wasn't expecting that i mean snakes crawl out of his head right And, and that's funny too is because it's like the lore there has no explanation. <laughs> I'm glad it doesn't. I'm Me too. It. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. I didn't need to hear um, the evil silver shamrock guy explain why they want <laughs> snakes to come out of the kid's head. Right. Um, this was at a time when movies didn't feel the need to explain uh, have, everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. now all of our movies are just, it's just exposition. Right. And we're both screenwriters. Yeah. Right. So like, do, I, I couldn't imagine like that, that script being submitted to a contest or like feedback. I know everybody'd be like, well, okay. I don't understand how, how this plays into it. There needed to be like a nugget. We needed to see like a snake in the beginning of the movie. Right. There yeah. needed to be like snakes in the beginning of the movie in order to, but back then it was kind of like the, mo- you know, you just, it was, it almost seems like movie, you just let the movie be the movie. Yeah. Right? Dude. Let the movie be the movie. If this if this script got sent out to the festivals we send out to, it would it would get <laughs> savaged. Just four out of ten characters, four out of ten premise, four out of ten dialogue. Um, yeah. And you know, I mean, it's not a great script. It's a it's a well designed script for a director to use in order to create a very entertaining horror movie. Right. There's a difference. I mean, the original Halloween, I die on this hill. It, that's not a great script. Um, it has the mechanisms in place. And John Carpenter, again, he would admit to all of this. Uh, mm-hmm. He's under no pretensions about um, the screenplays he works with. I think later in his career, he got more ambitious. Like They Live is such a, you know, a politically charged, socially driven movie. But so at the beginning of his career, he was just trying to really master his craft, mm-hmm. which is good. And I, you know, I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with that with Halloween. Like personally, like because I know a lot of people got really upset with Halloween Kills in the way that 
that movie kind of like doesn't make any sense and there's not really like a story there um but i was completely i don't know i was just fine with that i was just okay with letting it be the way that it was and enjoying it for other aspects Mm -hmm. instead of actually having to like really invest in a story i was okay with just this surface story and just some brutality yeah you know but I think people are waiting for the day when we get a sequel that is going to match the original. Um, it's been 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, the director of that movie has retired. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, don't get your hopes up. And I right. feel like people always do that when they see the new trailer and, you know, they're excited to see Michael come back. They're excited to see Jamie Lee Curtis come back. hmm and I share that enthusiasm, but I'm not, I'm not watching it to have a real companion piece of that original movie. I just want a fun slasher. Right, right. And that was totally how I felt like going into like Halloween Kills. Uh, there was so much of it that I, I really enjoyed. And I think one of the biggest things too is like, I mean, I'm a big fan of Jim Cummings. And so to see him like in the beginning of it, I was like, oh, hell yeah, let's, let's go. Oh yeah. Uh, as, as a police officer, I was so stoked about that. Yeah, the cast of that movie was really cool. You know, the guy from Midnight Mass was Lonnie Ellum and he was like my favorite character. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and I'm not all, like, let me also say this. There are people out there who do something I call standard shaming, which is they try to shame you for having standards for the movies you watch. Let me give you an yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody says they don't like Halloween Kills because you know some of the screenwriting wasn't uh, wasn't there for them. You know, some things didn't make sense. Some characters didn't feel like real people. And then somebody else comes along and says, "Oh, it's just a slasher movie. Can't you just have fun with the slasher movie? It's just like, why do you have to criticize everything? Mm-hmm. You know, that's standard shaming. Yeah. Like people have standards and criteria for what they watch. It's their right as individual people so just let people like what they like you know i mean i i I used to do more negative videos on on this channel criticizing things i like but i just started to feel weird like what am i actually trying to do am i trying to stop people from enjoying this like it's their own thing Mm -hmm. and halloween 3 is the best example of that you know just let people enjoy halloween 3 you don't like it because it doesn't have michael myers but some other some other people get some real enjoyment out of it yeah yeah and part of it too like you know is for me it's like i'm not really expecting that story because like i haven't gotten that story in the halloween franchise so it's like i can't i can't for me personally like i can't really expect there to be this like banger story with these like characters that i'm just like crazy about and i'm I'm like emotionally invested um i just i'm not gonna have that i think you know, kind of t- talking about again um, the way that viewers and the fan base perceived like season of the witch, um, and everybody kind of like wanting that same type of like it's like a feeling that they got when they watch Halloween, right? And it's like you're saying that's probably not going to happen again because like you're at a different place in your life. You know, you were younger, you had a certain expectation, you maybe saw it with some friends, you maybe, you know, you didn't even know really what to expect. And so like, there's more to it than just the film. It's yeah. it's literally like the human being where that human being is emotionally. And, and we're is, all just kind of like nostalgic creatures. Exactly. And this is getting back to something I brought up earlier you know, when I said I like the weirder sequels, and I think what I meant is I like the sequels that embrace the fact that they're not going to be Mm -hmm. like the original movie. They're not going to capture that essence again. They embrace that. They go in a new direction. And Halloween 3 is like the representative of that whole idea. So it's really actually a great case study for where franchises should be going because it's on the opposite end of the spectrum nowadays we have too much nostalgia too much like craving for what we used to have and halloween 3 is the exact opposite it's like screw that we're never going to have that again we have to yeah what did kylo ren say kill the past or something i don't know (laughs) yeah kill the past i'm pretty sure that's that sounds good 
sounds like something he would say. Kill the past and your dad. Yeah. But don't kill your dad. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I actually didn't even realize just how much Halloween 3 kind of served as a great proxy for so much of where movies are nowadays. Yeah, it's interesting. So what do you think they should do for the next Halloween movie? Halloween ends. What direction should they go in? Should they continue the nostalgia craze or should they say, we don't care what the fans want. We're going to do what we think is right. I say do something batshit crazy, right? Because that's what sticks, right? We're talking about Season of the Witch, you know, 40 years later, right? And we're talking about how it has a cult following. Um, And you're saying that the movies in the franchise that you like the most are the ones that took the swing as hard as they could. And I just think that's a good way Mm -hmm. to, if you're actually going to end it, which, you know, there's a chance it's probably not going to end, but um, just to swing, and do what you want. I'm like, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a film critic, right? I'm a screenwriter. I'm a filmmaker. Pave the way for me to do whatever the fuck I want to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's what movies that take these swings, they do. They, they open up the arts and that's what we want. We want the arts opened up, right? See- now, here's the interesting thing, because, again, the movies, the sequels that are considered the best are the ones that do play it the most safe, or at least try the hardest to recapture um, the OG Halloween spirit. So, like, you know, this movie did terribly when it came out. Halloween 6 did terribly when it came out. The Rob Zombie movies did well financially, but, you know, most of the fans hate those movies. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you see the record i don't blame you know the people at blumhouse for saying well we obviously don't want to come out with something that the fans hate so they have to they have to navigate that they have to navigate mm-hmm. those two extremes um i think halloween kills kind of got closer to finding that balance i would want so if they continue down that trajectory i think they will find something um, yeah, I just uh, I just don't want to see Michael Myers wandering around Haddonfield um, and Laurie Strode talking about the evil and have we have to kill the evil. I don't want that again, mm-hmm. you know. So well, yeah, I'm when not- I say go batshit, I'm not saying like make Michael Myers fly or anything like that. Like- I guess I like there, there needs to be some clarity. Yeah. I'm not saying like give the guy a cape or wings or whatever and he's flying around stabbing people okay i'm just saying um at this point there's so much division it's going to be hard to find that middle ground yeah right it truly is um they probably thought that they found it like you're saying like with halloween kills like you're saying like they 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 were pretty close to they probably thought they found it and then maybe I don't know, maybe a little shocked at the backlash that it has received from critics and fans. Are they um, going to notice that though? Because it did so well financially. But then that's what I'm saying. Like, so like it does so well financially and that it, even that criticism causes, like, wouldn't you like to make a movie that went viral because people couldn't like agree on some aspect of it? Like, I would love that. That would be like. It depends. Um, I don't want to. And this is kind of like the Ryan Johnson thing, right? Like, I don't want to come into a franchise, one of the biggest franchises, and be remembered for making one of the most polarizing yeah. movies in that franchise. What's your own um, film? Let's say your my own, own film. thing, my own film. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I would, I would, I would, I would be proud of that. Um, but that's different because something I also don't want to do is I just don't want to like be consumed by the all powerful machine that is that is Disney. That is all these <laughs> big studios that like, I mean, Star Wars is bigger than one screenwriter. Um, Halloween yeah. is bigger than one screenwriter. So you got to realize what you're stepping into. Yeah. Maybe I'm just getting a little crazy, but, <laughs> but let me ask you this though. Yeah. Is that, is it because I almost feel like it's Im- impossible. Like if John Carpenter, he's saying like after the first one, like it should have stopped. Right. At this point, like, what do you do? Like, I know you're saying, like, you go into a franchise like Halloween. It's a huge franchise. 
what do you actually write at this point? We're so many films past the first one, like, and they've all gone in like kind of weird directions in, in one way or another, maybe by yeah. keep, but keeping like a, a thread of like Michael Myers through them all. Like, except this one. Uh, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> well, he's in there. He's, a, he's, a, he's, he's definitely okay. not the thread they the wanted. Thread. Yeah. It's not the thread they wanted, but he's definitely in there. Um, but like at this point, you're the writer, Gabriel Theus. You're the writer of Halloween Ends. How do you not piss off the fan base? Like, I feel like that's just impossible. I feel like it's impossible. I feel like that's not exactly the right question. I don't know. I definitely don't want to pander to people. Um, well, first off, this is the third in a trilogy and you just have to follow certain things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to be honest, if I, if they had hired me as the writer for um, Halloween 2018, which they definitely should have done, call me blown out. <laughs> um, I would have just disconnected it from the original. I wouldn't have brought back anybody from the original movie aside from Michael Myers. I would have found, I would have said, you know, because at the beginning of the first movie, he just disappears. And I'm wondering what other adventures is Michael Myers going to go on? Like what, like the, I guess the door is open for all of these different paths you can go down. So I would want him to go to maybe a different town, stalk different people. Um, I think I just got tired of the, the evil speeches that people constantly made it would be cool for him to like really sneak up on unsuspecting people and, you know, create a new kind of um, just a new thing, a new movie. Yeah. Oh, well, too, because I know kind of like what we were, I think we kind of got off a little bit, but kind of what we were talking about was like, you were asking like, at like, what do you do with like Halloween ends? Right. Like, and you don't want to, displease the fan base and i was just saying like i just feel like it'd be so hard not to like I, if you would have stepped in and did that with halloween 2018 like somebody's gonna be pissed you know there's gonna be a, a big group of people but out there that are just pissed. yeah yeah think, and especially with this like mm -hmm. i don't understand what people are really expecting when it comes to halloween i mean they, they've been all over the place like yeah i mean people expect a movie as good or at least in the ballpark of the original right again the one yeah well, it's, it's it's not gonna, not gonna happen right it's not I gonna mean. happen <laughs> but it's hard to do that's not gonna happen like it's you know i'm a huge fan of spider-man the first two spider-man movies and if you tell mm -hmm. me you know you're never gonna get movies like that again in this franchise there's gonna be a bitter pill to swallow and mm -hmm. i won't want to believe you um so, yeah. and now we're getting into this big discussion about the Halloween franchise, which you could just spend a lot of yeah. time talking yeah. about. Um, and it's interesting because this movie has nothing to do with the Halloween franchise other than <laughs> having the, the name Halloween 3. Yeah. But um, I think if you have to do, let, let's say you can't do middle of the spectrum here. You have to lean more to one side. I definitely mm -hmm. prefer the side of the weird. I guess. Yeah. That. Okay. That's exactly what I'm saying. When I'm saying yeah. batshit crazy, just not like Michael Myers on dragons or anything like that. He can cross a line for sure. I mean, I think in the producer's cut of Halloween six, he, um, you know, content warning, he rapes his niece and impregnates her. I don't know if you knew about that. Yeah. That's weird. That That is a line I won't cross for yeah. sure. So yeah. So I don't watch that version. I watch the theatrical version. Um, which is also sacrilegious to some people, I guess. Mm -hmm. So just blast me in the comments, y'all. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have talked a great amount mm -hmm. about this very interesting little movie. And I wanted you to have the chance to leave your final thoughts on Halloween 3. What's its legacy? And will people continue to enjoy it to the point where it eclipses the other sequels. Um, final thoughts. Um, definitely watch it. It's a good one. Um, I I particularly enjoy it. 
Um, it's funny that's called Season of the Witch because I mean, there's tech, technically not what you would think. Like your, um, I don't know, usual thought about what a witch is like doesn't really take place in the film. So it does have a little bit of misdirection with the name Halloween, and then the fact that you know they they say the witch. You're you're kind of expecting yeah. a Even witch. Though- and- in all fairness, it's more of a Halloween movie. It's more about the holiday, right? It movie. is, yeah, and and it's it's a it's definitely different. I mean, like this one starts on October twenty third, right? I think it's the only one in the franchise that starts before Halloween, like a good amount before, yeah, like, that over a week before. Yeah, that the whole movie doesn't like really take place on Halloween. On Halloween, right? right. Yeah. yeah, for sure, it's alone on that. Well, I guess the Rob Zombie ones don't um okay his first remake it spans a long long time actually mm-hmm. so i guess that would be the other one that doesn't yeah so um you know just if you haven't seen it go into it with an open mind mm-hmm. um as far as i'm trying to remember everything you said but longevity goes you know i think maybe where it might get a little weird or people might start looking at it a little funny is with the doctor being like a womanizer type of person yeah. uh i'm not sure how long that will like hold up and last um with society i mean it's it's definitely like a little concerning but it it, it does explain that he's kind of like screwed up mm-hmm. it's not like oh he's doing these things and he's the greatest it's like he's doing these things and he's definitely not the greatest and even in the ends of the film the things that he's done are questionable, even though he's found out so much information and this doctor has given us a film in the end, like you could j- definitely just go back to the, to the beginning and think, well, should he have, have even like taken this trip that he takes um, to figure out the things that he finds out in the film? Um, yeah. And then what else did you ask? Yeah, about its legacy, because I'm curious as mm-hmm. to how um, how big it'll get in the fan community, if it'll start to rise through the ranks to be kind of, to be considered the one true sequel in mm-hmm. its own way, and the best, the best possible sequel for a movie like Halloween, um, that it go, it tries to capture the spirit of the holiday and it's very unique. I mean, remember the reason people liked the original movie when it came out is because it was original. People hadn't seen Michael Myers before. Right. Um, that was a very unique kind of character. So this movie actually is the best compliment to that because it's also original. <laughs> right. Right. And I think though the hard part about that though is like in like if, if you have Halloween come out and you have a character like Michael Myers who has basically, you don't know anything about this guy, right? You, you know that he's basically superhuman. Other than that, there's nothing that you really learn about. Not, not, not nothing, but there's very, very little that you learn about him. Um, and I could see going into Halloween 3, maybe thinking he's going to pop up and they're going to actually explore that more. And having this anticipation like wow we don't really know anything about this character and how would they build on it and think wow i want to see actually how they they build on it and then going in and i could see like people getting disappointed that it has nothing to to do with that um and i kind of lost my train of thought of like why i was even saying that but yeah i don't think it's ever going to be considered the one true sequel i think there's you know People like the Halloween movies because they like Michael Myers. If it doesn't have Michael Myers, I'm sure that's a deal breaker for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's always going to remain a black sheep, kind of like, I want to call it a renegade sequel. You know, it really went off and Mm. did its own thing, you know, didn't abide by any rules. Yeah. Um, People have been trying to kill it for years. (laughs) I'm sure some people are like really confused why Halloween 3 is now suddenly a cult classic, like why it's not just a forgotten you know um agreed to be bad movie Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's just the swing you know taking those swings unfortunately you know for tommy lee wallace at the time it didn't it didn't work out for him um which is kind of sad but yeah well i hope he um hope he's still proud of the movie and you know he didn't have a terrible career again he 
directed the it miniseries which is very famous and damn like buddies with john carpenter which is good enough for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right so yeah i mean unless you had any other notes that you wanted to cover i think um, uh, i think we have said a lot of really really interesting things about this i really hope people uh, get a lot out of our discussion here because i've been meaning to talk about the halloween discourse for a while because it got crazy after kills like i i was i was blown away by it mm -hmm. yeah this has been a lot of fun um i mean it was, it's an interesting film so interesting i mean it, it just you know you, you brought up the point of how it like you know touches on like commercial marketing and stuff and you listen to that the commercial because there's these um you know the masks that, that we were talking about and you know, you're, they're trying to sell the masks for the kids and just hype up the kids for Halloween. And they are very, very repetitive in showing that commercial throughout the film. Mm -hmm. And we're repetitive, like humans are repetitive, right? And there's something about it that's just kind of like a, like a hook, a hook. And I think that that's kind of a representation of this movie just in general. There's something about this film that like, hooks you whether or not that's a good thing for you or a bad thing the film will hook you mm -hmm. you know it'll it'll get your attention i mean that that jingle is going to stay in your head for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure yeah. all right well gabe it has been gabe. a pleasure to be joined yes. by a fellow gabe uh, all right audience let me know who is the one true gabe in the comments they're gonna say fight it out is it Gabe or Gabe? Let us know. <laughs> right. And uh, Gabe, why don't you tell people where they can uh, find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter, Gabe Braxton, B-R-A-X-T-O-N. And I'm fairly active on there. I have a good time on Twitter. Screenwriting Twitter is the place to be. Yeah. If you want to keep up with the latest contest that Gabe is placed in, that's definitely the best place to be. I mean, yeah. I think just the other day you got into the semifinals for the screen craft. Yes. And I was like really excited about that because um, when I first started screenwriting, screen craft was one of the like companies that I, that I stumbled across and started um, reading their articles and learning how to screenwrite. And so it's just like, you know, a bit of like, we were talking about nostalgia, but there's some nostalgia there with the company. And so like placing, and their contest like feels like really, really, really like big to me. So I'm I'm really excited. And getting semifinals in that contest so far, like I'm really excited to see how far it goes. Yeah, man. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for cool, tuning cool. in. Let us know how you feel about Halloween three. Uh, yeah. if you love it if you hate it, especially if you hate it, because I, I I do love reading those negative comments. It's <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so do that subscribe thing do that like thing do that follow thing and we will see you next time for do the thing all nighter discussions